We want to have a conversation now about uh, coffee. Okay. I like coffee. You like coffee? Yeah. Wake up and smell the coffee. There you go. Every morning. So for a very long time, coffee and tea were Kenya's biggest foreign exchange earners. That was, a, that was of course, overtaken by Kenyans. <laughs> <laughs> Kenyans overtook themselves. <laughs> Kenyans overtook the coffee Not and events. the tea that Not they were growing. They stopped growing the coffee. They went <laughs> and decided to go and get the dollars themselves <laughs> and bring them back here because something is happening. So now we have Kenyans in the diaspora as the largest contributor to foreign exchange in the country. And then now we have this crop. So we have floriculture coming in strongly. We've got tea and coffee. We've got um, tourism, big, big. The issue of uh, coffee has been a big one, um, especially in the coffee growing areas on how we get our coffee, on how we market our coffee, on how we sell our coffee, on how we access our markets. Farmers have been complaining. Yeah, we've been doing this coffee business for a long time. How much are we earning from this coffee business that we've been doing? Uh, farmers have been wondering, so can we directly sell coffee outside the country? I remember the last time we had we, a conversation here with the former deputy governor of Nyeri County, uh, Caroline Karogro, and she was talking about the same thing. This is what farmers and the county government of Nyeri and other county governments in the coffee growing areas are trying to say. How can we ensure that our farmers are actually earning more for their coffee produce? So we want to have that conversation. We are joined in studio by Laban Jigona. He's a founder and CEO of a company called Zabuni Specialty Coffee Auction. It's based in the United States. He's here with us. We want to welcome him with the day's proverb. City. This, yes, this is our final proverb from the country of... Which country was it again? Zambia. Exactly. Uh -huh. Whose capital is? Lusaka. Hey, my goodness. 10 out of 10. This morning, ten class, you are... Whose who's yes. president is? Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> 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 that's for you. City, come on. You're asking me the name of the president? Yeah, teacher. It's called ha Hakainde mm. Hachilema. Mm -hmm. That's the name of the president. Mm -hmm. mm. Hakainde Hachilema. Yes. Okay. That's his name. Mm. You want to know the name of the vice president? Mm. Okay. It's called Mutule yeah. Naimango. Hakainda Hachilema and Mutule Naimango. Yes. You want to know the national languages? No, of I think the, we're good. Uh, you're, you're good. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> 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 the what's the national language actually? It's called Bemba. Mm -hmm. Chibemba. I thought you were going to say it's called Kwacha. <laughs> Abana, that's the currency, sister. <laughs> so the currency is Kwacha? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Mm. Proverb. If you do not have teeth, do not break the clay cooking pot. If you do not have teeth, do not break the clay cooking pot. Yes. Chunga sana. Specifically, mm. clay cooking pot. Mm. It was used for something very specific. Yeah. Yes. Let's see whether Lab and Jogona are guests and the sons. Lab, good, good morning, man. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the hot seat of Kenya's biggest conversation. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, we, we tune in and watch you guys every day. We learn a lot uh, from this show. So uh, kudos. You guys have done fantastic. So even mm. when we're over there, mm. we're tuning in. Over there? Yeah. Nebraska. Where is over there? Uh, I'm in Nebraska, uh -huh. uh, USA. So uh -huh. diaspora, if there's any show I tune in for on radio, it's this one because we the diversity you know of thought of guests it's fantastic karibu sana and thank you for keeping it locked mm. even from nebraska thank you. this proverb from zambia what's your interpretation of it wow um my reading of it is uh you know if something may not be of benefit to you does not necessarily mean it will not be of benefit to others. Mm. So um, uh, don't go through life just destroying stuff. Um, you know, uh, can we do better? Can we leave um, our environment, our country, uh, you know, better for other generations? Mm -hmm. So uh, just because something may not be of benefit to me does not necessarily mean it's not of benefit to CT or somebody else. Right. 
Levin, how long have you been in the USA, in Nebraska, and what have you been doing? Um, in the USA, I've been there for 22 years. Mm -hmm. In Nebraska, 11. Uh, like many others, I left here to, to go to college. The plan was to come back. Um, but somewhere along the way, I, I fell in love with a girl there and uh, started, you know, mm -hmm. that journey. Got married, started having kids, and mm -hmm. so the USA became home. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I'm in Kenya about four to six times a year. I do come pretty often, of course. Four because to six of times every year. Not 46, four to six. Four yes. to six times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm here. I'm here rather often. Yeah. Uh, of course, I still have family here. My dad's here. I have a brother here, my grandmother. Um, but so, so it's home. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, I, I love the place, but, you know, this is a country of my birth, but uh, that's where I live. Right. Yeah. So Zabuni Specialty Coffee Auction, tell us about it. So Zabuni Specialty Coffee Auction is the first regularly scheduled specialty coffee auction in the world i know that's a mouthful mm. but basically what it is was when we got into coffee um about 12 years ago uh, when i looked at the origin and i looked at the market you know things were not making sense because here uh, coffee farmers are some of the poorest people <laughs> in in the world mm. or in this country but when i look at the market today there's no time like now that you know uh, they pay a really high price for coffee the consumption of coffee and this is largely being driven by millennials and gen z's they'll mm. pay six seven dollars a cup for coffee it's 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 not a fad anymore uh, they've been keeping this demographic since about 2010 watching uh, what specialty coffee is doing and what this demo why these demographics are consuming this coffee mm. so it's it's a cool thing, but after 10 years of double-digit growth, this is not something that's going to go away. Um, their parents were used to drinking, um, you know, Central and South American coffee, just get your fix. Mm. This, this demographic, this generation, and it's a huge demographic. We're talking a demographic of 120 or close to their million people mm. in the U.S. It's a huge demographic, therefore it's a huge market. They, they're about experiences. They're not just about getting the fix. It's about what am I experiencing? Mm -hmm. um, and then they're also about ethical sourcing. They're mm -hmm. about uh, communities, the social aspects of, of what happens to where the products they consume come from um, and, and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. the reason these guys um, or the reason we started Zabuni was because we just felt in the value and supply chain, the coffee farmer has been left behind repeatedly. Mm. And so I don't think that's by mistake. I think it's by design. Oh, mm. let's define specialty coffee. Yes. Just to be sure. What is that? So I'll, I'll just keep it simple because mm. there's a, there's a, a there's thesis. A, yeah. <laughs> but uh, basically specialty coffee is coffee that cups at 80 and above. Coffee has grades. So between 50 and 60 commodities, 60 and 70 or 60 and 65, you know, they're about, uh, you know, uh, is all considered commodity. Then you start getting into premium coffees. Specialty is only 4% of world production, but that's what this young demographics are consuming more than anything. Um, Sorry, when you say 60 to 70, 60, 60 to 70. So it, it's a scale. It's a scale mm -hmm. out of 100. Okay. If it cups at that when they... There's something called cupping, mm -hmm. which is uh, like maybe a wine tasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's how you determine the quality of coffee. Right. Um, here, mm -hmm. they tend to look at the screen size. On the market side, we tend to look at the cup. What does it taste like in the cup? Because that's what the consumers are, um, are enjoying. Are experiencing. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kenyan coffee, by and large, is always maybe uh, in that 70 to 80 range where you have premium and premium AA mm. and then a lot of it is also into the specialty coffee market. Mm. The problem is we're not good at defining Kenyan coffee as specialty uh, because we don't understand what it means on the market side. We don't understand 
that the moment you have that quality of coffee, we're producing it, but the people that come source it will never tell you this is specialty because they'll have to pay you more. Uh. But on the market side, the moment it crosses the border, then they'll slap it with all the specialty coffee. Uh, you know. Uh, mm. So people who are selling in can, Kenya are just selling coffee. They're just selling coffee. Not knowing. The people who are buying are know. buying mm. specialty. specialty. They know they're buying specialty. What prohibits that tag then from being placed on Kenyan coffee in Kenya? To me, I think we haven't really gotten to understand the market, who the consumer is in that market, how to appeal to them, and what it is they're looking for in these coffees. Because of the way you talk about 120 million people stateside who are very interested in this coffee, and we're talking about consumption here, isn't yes. it? Um, so are you saying that, number one, the research has not been done in Kenya in terms of the demographic and numbers of folks who are consuming coffee within the borders of Kenya, people don't understand the grade that they're looking for, are people walking into a coffee place, buying coffee off the shelves in their homes to consume it for a fix, like you said the parents of these Gen Zs were doing, mm. or are they actually consuming a beverage because they, you know, ha ha there's an affinity for this beverage. Yeah. What, are you saying none of these things have been done and folks are just drinking coffee because it's so available? So not extensively. Mm. Um, only 3% of production of coffee here is consumed locally. 97% is exported. Mm -hmm. um, we drink tea here. Yes. Mm -hmm. We don't drink coffee. A lot. Yes. So one of the things that, you know, we can do uh, to increase competition, make it better for the farmers, is create awareness here locally. Mm. You know, trends today are global. So when you have Gen Zs and millennials there doing things, it's a matter of time before it'll translate here. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, we are still tea drinkers, farmers, first and foremost. I believe that 3% that is consumed locally is probably <laughs> the expat community and, mm -hmm. and, and visitors that come into the country. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the best coffee that is Kenyan, you don't find it here. You find it outside. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't think we've done a good job of understanding the market and understanding who that consumer is. I find that hard to believe. Mm -hmm. Because coffee has been grown in this country for how many years? It was introduced by people who understood the market. They've been growing it here. So yes, there are small scale farmers of coffee and there are also large scale farmers of coffee, coffee estates. Those with coffee estates were doing it commercially. One of the things that you'd expect that they would do is understand what their market is and how their market thinks. So really, I'm finding it difficult to actually believe that 60 plus years of coffee being grown in Kenya and being sold externally and those that have been in this business have not understood the market. Actually, uh, Arabica coffee was introduced in this country in 18, 1893. 1893. 1893. Yes, so it's been here for a long time. Yeah. It's over a century. But then, so, Eric, uh, th think about it for a second. Even when we talk about tea, mm. most of what we drink, or what we call tea bags, is tea dust, just so that we understand. Locally. Yeah, it's mm. the speciality tea, the PF1, <laughs> that mm -hmm. is actually used for blending other teas. Those who are in the tea trade know this. Mm. They will understand it. The rest, what? And there's something in coffee they call mud. Mm. Okay? Now, that I didn't know until the former deputy governor of Nyeri came and explained this to us. Mm. I'm simply saying this, that the point you're making in my mind is an extremely valid one. But I have to add this rejoined. Are you saying that the knowledge that we have of coffee, how, let me think of a polite word. Is actually useless because we grow this coffee it's meant to benefit us but it doesn't benefit us as it should because we don't have adequate knowledge is that what you're saying what i'm saying is we're mm. very good at producing coffee mm. but they limit our capacity and ability to the borders of this country because then it benefits other people they come and take it from there we're good for the labor but we're not good on the dividends part of it to, to, mm. to receive our fair share. So, CT, what your question is profound. It's fantastic. Um, yes, that's exactly it. We, 
if we have it, there are certain forces maybe that are not yeah. allowing us yeah. um, to really exploit <clears throat> this information. Because if you look at even the, the coffee task force, yeah. they have literally nothing about marketing in the Western. It talks about the origin. It talks about the, the supply chain here but doesn't go beyond the borders of Kenya. Why? Because that's what we do. We produce the best coffee in the world, mm. then we wait for somebody to come and get it for us, as opposed to... So we are not in control of the entire value chain of coffee. We are only here dealing with production. From that point on, marketing into consumption, we have zero control over. Absolutely zero. By design. I believe it's, I, I can't sit down and say that this is just happenstance. It's been a hundred years of producing coffee. We've been selling coffee in Kenya the same way uh, for 85 years. And we've never changed or looked at, is there anything different we can do? They've introduced, you know, they've tweaked uh, things like, produ uh, you know, bringing in the, the second window, which was done by uh, President uh, Kibaki, mm. where they allowed... Um, certain people to seek buyers directly. Mm. Um, so they've done changes here and there, but holistically, they're always trying to do the changes locally, where I believe the changes need to be made are to access that market directly. Is there a country that you can use for us to benchmark with? Um, Ethiopia has done a fantastic job of that. Mm. What they've done is um, we had the leading market share and mind share for coffee in the United States of America for a very long time, up until maybe uh, around 2009, 2010, we started seeing those demographics changing. Why? Ethiopia became a little bit more aggressive into accessing the market. The other thing Ethiopia did, Ethiopia doesn't allow foreign companies to come into Ethiopia and deal with the production uh, and, and, and uh, you know, part of the primary and secondary processing. They don't allow that. Kenya, we've allowed them to come and do everything. So uh, what happens is now you have Ethiopians not only involved in the production, but in the early parts of the value uh, addition, you know, processes. So mm. uh, basically, um, foreigners, the big multinational corporations that we know come from uh, Europe, Asia, and Middle mm. East. In Ethiopia, they don't just have free reign. And here I think that has... How does, the, how does the Ethiopian bit. coffee get to the market, to the international market? So it's, by the way, Ethiopia learned their coffee model from Kenya. Mm -hmm. This is where they learned it from. They came here and learned how to process coffee, how to mark, all those things they learned from Kenya. Now we are going back there to learn from them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, it is, it, it's an odd uh, uh, kind of thing there that has happened. But Ethiopia is very good um, uh, at having their own people, places like North America, where they go set up their own entities and present this coffee to the buyers themselves there. With government backing? Whether it's government or private funds, I don't know. But I know that the Ethiopian government has been very good at helping to market their coffee in the North American market. And it's become very popular. Now it's the most consumed uh, African coffee in the, in the U.S. It used to be Kenya, but that's gone benefiting from these folks having free reign to sell coffee or to brand it as they wish in Kenya? Who's benefiting? Uh, not the farmer. I can tell you that much. Um, here's the thing. I'm not against entrepreneurship or business. If there's a way that you can add value to somebody or a process, by all means, please do it. But if the premise of this value is based on exploiting the farmer, mm -hmm. which is where I believe we've gone wrong for so long, uh, it's not going to work. So when you were asking the question about coffee estates, the largest producers of coffee today are small-scale coffee farmers, your mm. two to four acre. Their estates are gone uh, predominantly, or, or by and large, they're gone. Um, real estate, uh, of course, uh, people are... I uh, felt very disappointed with coffee. Um, but I think the problem is the information about the market and what is being paid for coffee. Kenyan coffee in the market 
I think does not translate or get back to these people to understand that. I see people uprooting coffee, I wonder you crazy because mm. there's still a lot of money to be made in coffee. Um, and the market is still consuming coffee and paying better for coffee now than they ever have. But, but you, you know what you say seems to point to this mindset that we have, that I run a coffee business and someone else must come and tell me about how I should benefit from my business. Yet we're in the communication age and if indeed I want to benefit from this business, should I not be the one driving this all? Are we saying that the people in that business do try and they do drive, but there's a certain support that is beyond them, which they should receive to be able to benefit as much as they could and they do not receive that support. Is that what we're saying? Yes, but <laughs> take for example, uh, Germany is considered one of the largest exporters of coffee <laughs> in the world. They don't mm. produce one coffee bush. So how is that? Mm. You know, um, yet here we've produced probably one of the most unique coffees, if not the most unique coffee in the world. Um, and yet we're seeding. It's like giving away our birthright to those guys, you know, for, for nothing, lit literally nothing, just here. Mm. And what CT is saying is, is absolutely accurate. Mm. Uh, in today's day and age, granted, the average age of a coffee farmer in Kenya is somewhere between 65 and 67. Yeah. I don't think they're going to be on YouTube and, uh, you know, and Googling stuff. Mm. But their heirs are. And in today's day and age, if you want to understand something, the information is out there. However, because of the nature or the way our smallholder farms and the way coffee is produced in Kenya, for these farmers to be able to access the market government has to play a role. We, we don't need to be making the kind of interventions we're making at the origin. We already know how to go coffee. Mm. Uh, we have been doing it for 100 years now. Mm. We have that knowledge. People need help with inputs, you know, uh, uh, things like that. But now we need to move this thing to the next level. We need to. We do it with flowers. Mm. We access the market directly. We take our flowers from here and take them to Europe, to the Holland auction. And that's where the buyers come and get the coffee. So we need to cast this wider net. Your largest buyers of coffee in the U.S. are not people who are going to afford to buy a container, which is mm -hmm. around $100,000. They're people who are going to be able to afford a pallet of Kenyan coffee. Mm. But repeatedly, they'll come back. And that, when you're casting a wider net, that's a better benefit to the farmers and mm. the origin because there'll be competition for your product. So we are not doing that. And I just think it's, it's high time that it happened. Uh, uh, that we start accessing the market directly. Let's take a break. It's half past nine. This is The Situation Room. Laban Jagona is founder and CEO of Zaboni Specialty Coffee Auction based in Nebraska, USA. He's here today to tell us why coffee farmers should be allowed direct access to the market. He'll explain what he means by that shortly. The moment farmer picks their coffee. Yes. So from the moment currently what happens, right? So basically what happens is when the farmer picks their coffee, for most farmers, they'll take it to their local wet mill, their local cooperative. Uh, and then at that stage, the primary processing is done. Uh, usually these farmers are in cooperative uh, uh, societies. Mm -hmm. And then they'll process, because of economies of scale, their production is so small. So they'll process together. Mm -hmm. Um, more often than not, farmers produce fantastic coffee. The ground and the environment does its thing, mm. right? Uh, where things start going wrong is in the processing. So having a processing manager that knows what they're doing is really key. Because you can't improve quality by processing, but you can definitely mess it up. Mm. So... Once the farmer delivers their coffee, picks their coffee and delivers it to their local wet mill, then the processing method begins, whatever that method is for them. For okay. some people, it might be a washed. Mm. Uh, for, for people now in other parts of the world, but in Kenya, we're a little bit of a one-trick pony mm. where all our coffees are usually done through the washed process, mm -hmm. which means the, 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 the coffee cherry is taken off of the the bean or the pod mm. and then that goes through um, different uh, fermentation processes mm. and then the mucilage off of that is washed off in this um, washing channels 
um, other people now get that cherry and then they just put it, put it on African raised drying beds and then they gradually turn that. And as the coffee dries, the cherry dries with it. And mm. so all that flavor and sugar is absorbed into the bean. Into bean. And that's what we call the natural process. Okay. The other processes, you know, now there's anaerobic, pretty much the way they do coffee or here they call it carbonic maceration. Mm. Um, so, so all these different ways of processing coffee, but Kenya, it's washed, mm. which is very good and is very consistent. So once the farmer does that, then uh, the cooperative is going to engage with a marketer and the marketer will come and get the coffee or the cooperative will deliver the coffee to the marketer uh, in parchment form. Okay. The marketer from there has the responsibility of, wait, there's the secondary, uh, after the primary processing, there's the secondary meal. Mm. That's who um, is going to take the coffee, um, take the husks off, polish it, bag it, and then the marketer is going to take over from there. The okay. marketer now takes that coffee. Their responsibility is to market. Their responsibility is to find buyers for this product at the best price possible. Does, it, does the marketer... So from the meal, what comes out of the meal? The parchment. Coffee in parchment form. Mm -hmm. um, I wish is I it, is it graded in any way? At that point, not yet. Not yet. Once the husks are taken off, the dry husks... Mm. Mm that's when the grading happens and that's usually done by the the miller the secondary miller okay now most cooperatives don't have don't meals. own meals they can't afford them mm. they're too expensive so the people that own these meals are predominantly uh, estates and very well to do uh people that saw an opportunity and invested in that area okay or the multinational corporations that are vertically integrated in the supply chain that have the resources to come in and make those kinds of investments. Okay. Um, but from that point, after them, I don't want to get into the details because a lot of these people also double deep. The dealer is also a marketer. The dealer is also, uh, you know, a, a miller. The dealer is also an exporter. The dealer is the same person, different names. Okay. So well, let's just go with with <laughs> with the position in the in the value chain. Yes. So you've got the big miller who will then now come and start categorizing it. So now right. they'll yes. And they'll, then they hand it over now to the marketer. Yes. Okay. So the marketer will present those coffees to the auction or through the second window to a buyer. Basically, the second window means that it doesn't go to the Nairobi coffee auction. This mm. is just a direct deal. You've liked the coffee, I've told you what I have, you've agreed on a price pay go okay the auction is supposed to be open to everybody who is licensed to access that auction but it's a very limited number mm. of people who are licensed who are licensed by the government of kenya to be at that auction either you know to buy product mm. um and i think that's part of the problem here is is what's the qualification to be licensed well there's a process there's a vetting process and then you got to pay the fee mm. um you know before i think there was a time you had to have to be a marketer i think you had to have a bond of about a billion <laughs> so there was only i think six or something so licensed marketers in this country dealing with all of kenyan coffee mm. i think now it's a hundred million mm -hmm. still there's not a lot of people who have a hundred million sitting somewhere mm. you know to, to place as a bond yes so they are, they're still very limited. The marketers are still very limited. I don't think there are more than 20 in this country. Dealers are, are, are a little bit more, and I think the, 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 the standard of becoming a dealer is a little bit lower. Uh, but nevertheless, they're still limited. To me, when I look at an auction, I'm thinking of, AB, of, of, of an eBay. Mm. Anybody should be able to come, whoever offers the most should get the product. Mm. It should not be limited to a few people but that's how it's controlled okay. uh, at, the, at the auction system. And, and so it serves a few and still at the expense of the farmer. Mm. Because at the end of the day, that product belongs to the farmer. Um, but the farmer releases that product mm. to the marketer. And after that, the marketer is the one who pretty much has determination of what's going to happen to that product. And, and part of this process or what we're saying mm. is... I don't think the farmer should ever give up control of that product until it is bought. Whether it is being bought at the Nairobi auction, whether it is being bought in the West, the farmer should always be consulted 
and told what they are being paid. Is the marketer acting as an agent of the farmer or has the marketer purchased the produce off the farmer? No, the marketer hasn't purchased. They are working as an agent. The marketer is a god. So they, they sh <laughs> basically should be res re answerable to the farmer. They should be answerable to the farmer. But, but not. not necessarily because, first of all, the farmer you're dealing with doesn't understand how the value and supply chain, how things work after the meal, after they deliver their coffee, their cherry, to their, the local uh, to the local meal. From there, they have no understanding. For example, my grandmother is 108 years old. She's been growing coffee all her life. She's still a coffee farmer to this day. Mm. I mean, so is it? What so does she then, know beyond her mm. her village? Mm. Aren't we going back to the uh, that preferred idea then? That it seems to me, you know, that it's been designed this way. Because if the farmer were to know, like the situation that you're giving in Ethiopia, for example, or even look at what farmers in Brazil, other mm -hmm. countries around the world, if they were to know the cost after they present products to the mill, chances are that they would hold on to their product a little bit longer to be able to get the best rates for the value. So it is possible that it has been designed this way because if you are ignorant of something chances of you pushing for a particular thing then are much less yes you know um if if you're if you're educated or something on something or you're aware of something mm. then you'll know what interventions to make where mm. but the farmer has been deliberate deliberately uh, deliberately kept in the dark um because knowledge is power mm -hmm. but that's what we're saying is this value and supply chain needs to be opened up for that farmer to see exactly who makes what where mm -hmm. on that value chain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day the farmer to me is the owner of the coffee and so they should always be uh, uh you know uh their their their, their, their advice their their feelings their thoughts they should always be, uh, you know, they, they, they sh we, we should be talking to them mm. at every stage of the process. They should be the God. Yes, but it's not the case right now. Mm. Uh, the marketer will come and take the coffee and someday a check will show up or, you know, some money. Um, and, and that's what it is. There's no, you have no say. It doesn't matter what it costs you to grow that product. Mm. Um, but the truth of the matter is it should not be that way. It can be different. What would happen... Let's step into the ideal or a different, uh, you know, universe for a minute. What will happen if we're looking at the Kenyan situation and the farmer is empowered, the farmer is aware, and the farmer is making a little bit of money? What would happen across, uh, you know, along this chain, marketer, miller, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, export? What would what would happen? So it's already happening. Basically, what's happening right now is that what is being paid is not coming back to the farmer mm. on the market side. They're paying good money for mm. Kenyan coffee. Mm. It's just not coming back because of the number of people in this value and supply chain yeah. dipping their hands in that mm. cookie jar. Yeah. I'm trying to, I want you to paint a picture of what would happen if it was. So, number one to me would be, there would be a major difference in these communities. Mm. Uh, their families, their economic and social welfare will be better. Um, don't forget about you know the foreign currency that would be coming back to this country today the people who come and buy when they do the value addition and do whatever there the money stays there mm -hmm. but if we were selling our product there if we were exporting then money would be coming back mm -hmm. this way mm -hmm. but it's other people who are coming and exporting it for themselves I, I i i know it may seem a little bit unfair i'm an eternal capitalist but every country does this mm -hmm. everybody protects one way or another they're their They're producers mm -hmm. or exactly you yeah. know we're not trying to be unfair but we're also saying that some things need to change now mm -hmm. here's the thing that for me i'm really advocating for is that the farmer mm -hmm. should be given the choice mm -hmm. should they sell their coffee here or should they sell it directly in the market um, now this farmer cannot afford to get their product to the market mm -hmm. you know the 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 the, the, the costs um, and that's why i see a role for government coming in especially mm -hmm. if now we have you know the deputy president in charge of coffee mm -hmm. uh, and 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 you know trying to find a way of making sure that farmers 
uh, uh, I don't want to use the word <laughs> guaranteed, but mm. the farmers do get a living wage or they're able to earn a living Something wage. From the, exactly. Then it's never going to happen if they do not access the market directly. directly. We'll be back here but five never. years from now, ten years from now. It'll never happen. Levin, you've just told us about, you know, the case of your grandmother and very many of our grandmothers and elderly parents who are still in the coffee business. They don't understand anything beyond picking coffee, taking it to the nearest uh, yes, mill. Yeah. They don't understand anything more. Now, you're telling that this person to access the market directly. Yes. With a limited knowledge. Aren't you opening the door for bigger vultures? That's where government comes in. There has to be policy. There has to be framework that protects my 108-year-old grandmother. Mm. Now, we already have a very organized structure. Uh, it has very poor leadership and governance, but the structures are there. Mm. The other thing is, if government really wanted to make a difference in coffee, the infrastructure is there. Coffee it would not require huge investments. The mm. investments would need to be made in the, in the marketing or the branding of the product. But locally, we have billions in assets and infrastructure here that can be switched on tomorrow and mm. it's good to go. But you're depending on government goodwill. The same government that's in control of the auction process. The same government that has controlled the number of people who act as marketers, who act as... Uh, what, are we calling them agents in the yes. auction? Dealers. The dealers in the auction. This is a government, instead of saying, open up so that we have more dealers in the auction, open up so that you have more marketers in the auction, and the government has been knowing this and has been controlling it. You're saying, open up so that in the government you can now focus on auction and at the same time focus on open market. No. This government will not do it. What I'm saying is, this government, and especially this administration, that was one of their big promises. Mm. So if they need a solution, this is the solution. It's directly accessing the market. But it will still be good for Kenya holistically because of the forex that it earns. It will help the farmer because the farmer will sell their coffee better. Why? They have a bigger market. They have a, you know, a bigger pool. To, to and, ba and bargaining power. And bargaining power. The difference, here's the difference. Mm. It costs about $25, maybe $25 to $30 at the most to ship a bag of Kenyan coffee, 60 kg, to the North America. Mm. That's even, you know, on the higher side, <laughs> right? So, for example, right now, coffee maybe is doing a little bit better because Brazil production has been down due to the frost. Mm -hmm. It is not any government intervention. Let me say that clearly. Why farmers are experiencing better prices for the last two years is not because government has done anything positive. It's God. It's because Brazil went down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're going to be back up. Within the next year or so, their production is going to come up. And what's going to happen to our prices again? Deep. Yes. So if they want a sustainable solution, whether Brazil goes up or down, mm. that they always have good prices, they'll have to become exporters. Now, what I'm saying... It costs about $25. What I'm trying to explain here is at the auction here, your average price of a bag of AA is maybe between $250 and $350. Mm -hmm. When they take that bag of coffee, they add no value. Just ship it. They just pay that $20 to get the bag to the North American. Immediately, They're they average $200. about $600, $700. Mm. So why are we leaving that money on the table? Who are we leaving it for? I would make the investment of $25 and make the upside. Mm. But we've never been in that space. The Ethiopians now have started learning to be in that space and make sure their product gets to market and they sell it there. You know what I find interesting? Huh? I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm thinking of a competing crop called tea. Okay? Where is the world's largest coffee auction? I know it's not in Kenya, that's for sure. The world's largest I, coffee auction, where is it? Mm. I have no idea because most, okay. many, many countries do not sell their coffee via auction. Mm. Yes. Yes. Estates do that. People who produce coffee auction their own coffee. Now, we have a situation in this country where we competed favorably with Sri Lanka as the world's tea auction headquarters. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, 2020, the government then banned direct sales 
of T to the world market direct. Meaning, I have a factory, I have T, I can't sell directly. It has to go through the auctions. Right? Right now, we're talking about a glut. T at the auctions that cannot actually move mm. because the private sales that would t be an offload of some of the coffee isn't there. I mean tea, sorry, not coffee. Mm. Now, the tea sector for the longest time hasn't been turbulent. I mean, farmers make money. Sometimes we have a little drought. There's a bit of a problem. But there's arguably some stability because people hear of bonuses, people hear of this. Now, one doesn't hear much about the coffee industry. Mm. And it's under the same ministry. Ministry of Agriculture. How is it that the tea farmers and those who work in the tea sector have been able to make some progress and that progress somehow seems to be absent in the tea uh, sector? I mean, the, in the tea sector, they've made progress. In the coffee, <laughs> coffee sector. Coffee, no. Yes. Mm. Why? It's, it's by design. State capture. Uh, <laughs> to me, <laughs> um, it benefits a few at the expense of the many. Mm. And, and that is protected. But I'm still saying here that these two tracks can run concurrently. Mm. The farmer needs to be given the choice. Do you want your coffee to go to the auction mm. or do you want your coffee to go to the market and be sold there globally directly? Okay. And that intervention is what I'm saying. It will cost government little to nothing mm. because it's already being done. The systems and structures are in are place. In place. But it will never happen if we keep insisting that coffee, by and large, has to be sold over here. Mm. Um, so the, the future of coffee in this country, its uniqueness, um, there's something called the revealed comparative advantage, you know, products that, that countries export. The highest revealed comparative advantage of any product in Kenya is coffee, which means that in the mind of consumers in the West, that is the one product that they can relate or identify Kenya with. Um, there's a country called Costa Rica that has done a fantastic job with a product they produce called the Chiquita Bananas. The mm. Chiquita Banana, it's the most popular fruit in the U.S. Mm. If Costa Rica wants to start anything, if they want to sell tea, they first bring you their banana. This is the quality of product that we produce. <laughs> mm. If they want to, uh, uh, you know, sell uh, avocados, they first bring you their banana. Why? Mm. Because the highest revealed comparative advantage is their bananas. Mm. So Costa Rica actually does better with coffee than we do, yet we produce a far higher quality of coffee <laughs> than Costa Rica does because they've learned how to market how to and how to communicate <laughs> to the consumer there. If they want to perform at the Super Bowl halftime, they first bring you the bananas. bananas. <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs> when the Kibaki administration opened this secondary window, what was that and so why wasn't that fully open to what you're talking about so the second window is basically another option for a long time the second window wasn't there and farmers really fought oh we want to sell they were given the second window that's what you know that, that that's what uh, uh, government envisaged as a way mm. but the people who are in the value and supply chain the traders know very well that farmer can't go and market the coffee in the west that farmer can't you know they know that so it's it's helped but it's a large by and large mm. i can say it's been ineffective because now we can look and see that the farmers are not doing me my barometer is always is the farmer doing better mm. if the farmer is not doing better then whatever yeah. initiative you've come up with is it's a flop 40 seconds no 30 seconds Lebanon. that's a message to the government so the deputy president is now in charge of this coffee business speak to him if I was sitting in front, I would tell him I see his passion. I see that he does want to make a difference. But I also see that there's some information and, uh, and uh, knowledge that has not gotten to him. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to be put in front of them. Uh, we have all the data, we have all the numbers, and we can show them exactly what it means to access the market directly and to make sure that that farmer gets a guaranteed minimum return. We know in the West we don't like saying that. Mm. Uh, it, it scares a lot of people. But basically what we're just saying is we're guaranteeing that farmers are going to do well and earn a living wage. Okay. Mm.
Laban, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Laban Jagona is the founder and CEO of Zaboni Specialty Coffee Auction, based in the USA. He's been here campaigning and pushing for Kenyan coffee farmers to access the market directly so they can earn more, earn better, and also market Kenyan coffee and package it better. Thank you for tuning in to Kenya's Biggest Conversation this week. Have a lovely weekend. We'll be back on Monday, God willing. It's now 10 a.m. Thank you for tuning in to Kenya.